are we teaching the truth in love with light? Hello dear listener. This is Brother Derek Gillespie. Welcoming you to the very first episode of this new series. What I might call a podcast. Since you will not be seeing me live on screen. But I will be sharing with you by voice and by pictures and by images. As you can see on screen the title of this new series why I remain a Seventh-day Adventist my personal journey of conviction and my defense of Adventism before we get into the meat of the matter I ask that you will bow your head with me as we petition the Great Father, the God of heaven and earth. O oh my Lord, O oh my God, O oh my Father, visit us with your presence. Rest your hand upon this speaker. Humble me so that only Jesus will be seen. Open the ears and the hearts of the listeners, and may the words spoken be to thy name, name's honor and the glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Now, dear listener, it is very important for me to first of all establish what is my reason for doing this series of which you're now hearing episode one, the first episode in this new series? Now, there are several reasons, but prime of which is I am one of those persons who strongly believe that the, the word of God should be your guide in every sense of the word as a missionary, as an evangelist. And the Bible may explain that we are to be ever ready to give a reason for the hope that we have within us. And of course, the Bible also tells us that we are to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And so, dear listener, it is not uncommon for you to meet, whether it be on the internet or in book form or via television, Testimonies of persons who have declared their reasons for leaving Adventism. You don't have to look very far to see examples of that. And so, we can look, for instance, at one of the prime examples as you can see on screen. The most famous modern former Adventist that is now out there on the internet, on television, in book form, declaring his reasons for leaving the Adventist church, has written several books, and one of his most renowned ones is, as you can see on screen, Truth Led Me Out, written by Dale Ratzlaff, a former Seventh-day Adventist pastor, who became a very staunch critic of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And his books are sought out because it is believed that he being on the inside as a pastor for, for many years, he must know what he's talking about. And so people seek out his books and they use his books as foundation for their attack against the Adventist Church. But of course... If I am otherwise convinced than Dale Ratzlaff, then I will simply say, in total opposition to 
his book, Truth Led Me Out. I will say to you, dear listener, that truth has allowed me to stay and to remain a Seventh-day Adventist. And I believe that if I have strong reasons for doing so, reasons which may clarify issues, reasons which may, which may clear up issues of contention, reasons which may impact people and their knowledge of the truth of the Bible, and indeed may lead someone to make a decision for God, then it is my duty to share what are those reasons. Why, in opposition to Dale Ratzlaff, who declared that truth led him out of Adventism, I am here declaring why I remain a Seventh-day Adventist. And so I, welcoming, I welcome you rather on this journey of discovery. Come with me now as I share with you some very fascinating truths in my own experience, which Sorry to say, I have to disagree with Dale Ratzlaff. And not just Dale Ratzlaff, but if you're a Jamaican like me, belonging to the island of Jamaica, a country which is considered uh, we are the leading religious group in the island, the entire island, is a fast-growing Seventh-day Adventist movement. And so... There is no Jamaican or hardly a Jamaican who can say they have never heard of or don't know of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Because at the moment, as I said, we are the leading religious group, the fastest growing and the most influential in the island. And so when people like who I'm going to show you now take a stand and leave the Seventh-day Adventist Church. It creates ripples across the island and much talk. And let, let me first refer to a particular brother who was one of our leading theologians at the Northern Caribbean University in Jamaica, Dr. Clinton Baldwin, as you can see on the screen, who appeared on the Religious Hard Talk program on national television in Jamaica which was at the time hosted by the now late Ian Boyne, who you're seeing on the right of your screen. And Dr. Clinton Baldwin, who you're seeing on the left of the screen, he decided to come public, has now published books, one book in particular promoting that instead of the Sabbath remaining as a literal day for observance, it has now become Jesus. Jesus has become the Sabbath the Sabbath is now the person of Jesus. I'll get back to all of those issues eventually in this in this presentation. But there is he displaying his book after he left the Adventist church. And he's now a fiery anti-SDA preacher. Fiery anti-Sabbatarian and almost everything that Adventism stands for. He's out there on the internet all over the place attacking and trying to win disciples to his new found view. And Clinton Baldwin, when he appeared on national television, it created ripples. Not just among Adventists, brethren who are probably not strong in the faith, but of course it was much talking point among people in Jamaica and in the Caribbean and indeed the world, because Dr. Clinton Baldwin is a well-known theologian who actually taught Bible students and pastors in training at Northern Caribbean University. So he's one of those who recently left. And I will simply say, just like Dale Ratzlaff, he's now declaring that truth led him out. But I will simply show you reasons hereafter as to why truth, properly understood, is what kept me to remain a Seventh-day Adventist. On screen, you will see another brother who recently left has now become a staunch anti-Sabbatarian and critic 
of the Adventist Church. Brother Elsie Thunder Lauriston. Thunder is, is what he's popularly called as a preacher. His real name is Elsie Lauriston, who has now left the Adventist Church and he too went on religious hard talk, the local program in Jamaica, to declare his reasons. And now, today after doing that, he's now a staunch supporter of Sunday worship. All over the place running seminars and internet webinars and all of that to teach people to worship on Sunday. And giving all the reasons why the Sabbath is no longer important or at least is not important to, be, to observe for salvation or in obedience to God. Former SD Adventist. There, let me bring up on screen so you can see this banner introducing him late last year, August 2020, as the guest speaker. There it is, Elsie Thunder, who is now a staunch critic of the Adventist Church and a promoter of Sunday worship. Another former SDA who, and um, let me point out that Elsie not only appeared on Religious Hard Talk a couple of times to declare his reasons for departing the Adventist Church, but he also has produced books. And one of his first books he produced was um, All Foods Are Clean and Every Day is the Sabbath, as you can see on screen. A book challenging the Adventist Church that he was a member of on the issue of the Sabbath and diet. There is his name at the bottom of the book. And I personally, having read the book, I had no choice but to produce my own response. A publication which I made in 2017, as you can see on screen. And that book has been published free of cost. You can acquire it um, if you so desire. I will post the link below this podcast this presentation on uh, Facebook and on YouTube so that you can acquire this book, a response to Elsie's book, free of cost. And of course, Elsie has produced another book since. This book came out recently, The Sabbath, What You Need to Know, 16 Propositions Against Mandatory and Salvational Sabbath Keeping. So he's very active trying to undermine the church that he was formerly a part of. That is Elsie, Elsie's journey. That is his testimony. Now, my reasons for staying, I will be sharing with you shortly. But let me close with another famous Jamaican. On screen, you see Dr. Andre Hill. Um, now, I think a theologian. He was in training recently. I don't know if he's finished his course, but he's now, of course, um, he has his doctorate. And so he's now Dr. Andre Hill. Left the Adventist Church in about 2013. Also went on religious hard talk, the journalism program in Jamaica, to declare his reasons. So we have these, these, these famous Jamaicans. Oh, by the way, I might add, dear listener, that if you wish to see my full response to... Um, Dr. Andre Hill that you're seeing on screen, you are invited to see my book responding to all his charges and claims against the Adventist Church. I have made sure to put it in writing and I also made a personal response to him on national television. Um, I will post a link to those videos and those written presentations that I've made in response to Dr. Andre Hill when he left the church as well as um, my response to Elsie Thunder when he left, Thunder Lauriston when he left the Adventist Church, and he made several charges. I made sure to respond to those both in writing and in conversation form, as well as in videos. And I'll post a link. All of those links will be, will be below uh, this presentation on Facebook, as well as YouTube, so you can get greater detail as to how could these brothers, brother, now Dr. Andre Hill, 
that you're seeing on screen, how can his charges be responded to? Very intellectual, seemingly high powered and, 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 and their arguments cannot be defeated. But I've always said that things are not always as they appear and it's always good to dig for the facts before you jump to conclusions. And so Dr. Andre's, Andre Hill's journey has been documented and my response to his, his claims and his charges when he left the church, they are now public and you can access those presentations free of cost um, but just by visiting the links below this presentation. And so with that background now laid where we have these brothers who left the Adventist church claiming that, of course, truth led them out where they now no, have no choice but to be constantly attacking the doctrines and teachings of the Adventist church. It is now time for me to respond, to share with you, dear listener, what are my reasons Despite it may be that Dale Ratzlaff is, Ratzlaff is claiming that truth led him out. Despite it may be the case that Andre Hill, highly intellectual, well-spoken, has declared his reasons for leaving. Same may be true of Dr. Clinton Baldwin and of course Elsie Lauriston. What are my reasons for staying? And dear listener, there is no better way for me to address this issue. It cannot be that I'm going to share with you just my opinions. What better way for me to do that <clears throat> but to go straight to the only source that matters and that is the Bible. I invite you now in the next half an hour or more to come with me and I'm going to share with you two basic things in this presentation before I close this first episode. And it is, why do I remain a Seventh-day Adventist? And I'm now going to address two very critical issues. One has to do with, of course, it's in the very name Seventh-day Adventist and it is the issue of the second coming of Jesus. I won't spend much time on this issue too much because it is, it is a commonly shared doctrine among all Christians who believe in the second coming of Jesus. But I want to say this before I move on to the next issue, which I'm sure you, you are itching to hear me talk about and defend. And it's despite all the attacks against the name Seventh Day, meaning, of course, within the name Seventh Day Adventist is the clear indication that I am a believer in and supporter of observing God's Holy Sabbath out of love and respect for Him. But at the same time, because God is calling in my belief true worshippers of Him to recognize Him as Creator through observing his sabbath and i'm going to and i'm going to prove that that belief is valid straight from the script, scriptures shortly but before i get to that let me talk about the the second coming of jesus you know we live in a world where more and more people are becoming atheists and unbelievers and people are departing the church and i'm talking of the church general not just the adventist church but the church in general the more people go to colleges and universities and, and become more modern in their studies. I mean, you have Google just at the, 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 the tip of your fingers. You can click on a cell phone or swipe a screen and be, be, be privy to so much available knowledge in the modern world. And people feel that the more they become aware of knowledge and information and become educated, Jesus and his message that he's coming again to set things right is becoming outdated and no longer valid. If you wish to see 
why I believe in Jesus. Concrete, biblical, logical, historical reasons why I believe in Jesus. I will also share below this video the link to a presentation I made as to how Jesus is proved both inside and outside the Bible. And of course, with the Bible being the textbook for the Christian, it is only reasonable that if someone asks, how do you prove that the Bible is valid in the first place? Why believe it? I mean, there are so many other books out there claiming to have religious validity or they are the word of God. What makes the Bible stand out? And this all goes back to the issue of what you see on screen. If the Bible is not true or valid, if it cannot stand the test of fierce scrutiny, then believing in the second coming of Jesus makes no sense, cannot stand. And so that is why I'm also going to share with you below this video the link to a presentation I made. How can we prove that the Bible is true, is valid, and is a book that is so compelling that it cannot be ignored once it is rightly understood? But let me go back to the issue on screen. For 2,000 years now, Christians have been waiting for the second coming of Jesus. And of course, Jesus himself predicted that his followers would, would, would consider his coming delayed. He told so many parables of his disciples becoming weight weary. They would have waited so long that many of them got careless, fell asleep. And of course, some start to even doubt that he would return. Don't we see much of that happening today? I mean, think about waiting for 2,000 years or more for Jesus who declared that he would be coming back soon. That's an issue I'm going to address in another presentation in the future. But I strongly believe that what God has going for him are the signs of the times that Jesus left as a warning. And every time we look and see what is happening in the world, we just need to go back to Matthew chapter 24, Luke chapter 21. And see, compare those two chapters of Jesus telling us what the world would have been like. And as he, as the time got closer and closer to his coming, the greatest event that could ever happen on this planet is for us to see the second coming of Jesus Christ. And so, my brothers and my sisters, it is my conviction that the most urgent message that can ever be shared by any Christian is to constantly keep before the eyes of the people on this planet that it is countdown time to the coming of Jesus. And everything takes second place to that message. And one of the main reasons why I remain a Seventh-day Adventist is that it is not only biblical, but it is so attractive and appealing to see that one of, in fact, the primary message of the Seventh-day Adventist Church is that of preparing people for the second coming by what we call preaching the three angels message. Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through to 12, a message of preparation for this most awesome event that is upon our doorsteps, the second coming of Jesus. There is not, there is no other church out there who is as, who are as pointed in presenting a message of preparation for the second coming of Jesus Christ than the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And I tell you, that is why it appeals to me so much to remain. Because in Revelation chapter 14, verses 6 through to 12, I would advise you to read it, my dear listener, to familiarize yourself with this awesome message. And when we read, we realize that God is not just telling us 
that his son is coming back and has left signs to let us see signposts along the way way marks as you would call them to tell us that Jesus is soon to return and the more we see the signs taking place it's a constant reminder but in Revelation chapter 14 we have not just a reminder but we are given a solemn warning of things we should avoid and things that we should be careful to make note of in preparation for the second coming of Jesus. And so the first angel tells us, a symbolic angel, because the book of Revelation is a symbolic book. And so a broadcast is being made via these symbolic angels, a preaching ministry as it were. And the first angel tells us that God's judgment is upon us and we are to worship him as creator. The second angel warns the people of earth to avoid receiving the mark of the beast and of course receiving the second and third angels they give one united message on that very very awesome solemn reality that many of the people of earth including Christians are in danger of receiving what is called the mark of the beast and I'm gonna get back to that issue in another episode coming up but think about this if Jesus had just told us that he was coming back but not leave us with warning signs and signals we probably would have been in problems because we would not have known how near he really is or whether or not we should believe that he's coming back but he gave us signs and the more we look for those signs in the world around us when we see them happening we know that jesus really meant what he said and of course we may see the signs and we know he's coming coming back but if we don't know the serious dangers we are to try to avoid more than any other then we would also be in problems and when we see the Adventist church among all the churches constantly reminding people of the serious warning in Revelation chapters chapter 14 verse 6 to 12 that contrasted to those who will receive the mark of the beast are those who are described in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 12 those who survive the threat of this issue of the mark of the beast and and worshiping the beast and its image and those who are not fearing God as they should and worshiping him as creator we see of course the Adventist church the only church on the planet presenting this message of warning of the three angels in Revelation chapters chapter 14 verses 6 through to 12 and because that, 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 that message is so important, once you understand the, 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 the details of the message and what is involved, you cannot help but sit up and pay attention. And I'm going to be dealing with this issue of the mark of the beast in another episode. But this is one of the reasons why I stay. I remain a Seventh-day Adventist because no other church on the planet is presenting this message of warning to the world as this church is doing and so dear listener my first reason why i remain a seventh-day adventist is that the most urgent message that jesus has left with his church to pass on to the world is a message to constantly remind them of his second coming and that it is going to be a day of judgment a, a, a day of fearsome agony for those who are lost and of course in preparation for this coming there is a work that must be done in the lives of those who are preparing for the coming of Jesus I mean when you think of when Jesus came the first time he sent before his face a messenger a forerunner and when we listen to the message of John the Baptist preparing the world for the first coming of Jesus, 
What was his message? One of repentance. He did not mince words. He was in the faces of kings like Herod. Leaders and priests. Like the scribes and Sadducees in Israel. And from leaders right down to the normal regular person. He was saying repent. For the kingdom of God is at hand. And he laid out. The way that people should reform their lives. Because preparing for the coming of the king. Is much more than just expectance. It is a life work of preparation. And so. Another reason why I stay. I remain with the Adventist church. Is that its message is one that is pointed. Calling people back to God. And notice church people as well. I notice that you know. One of the, the charges that Elsie, Thunder Lauriston and Andre Hill and Dr. Clinton Baldwin and Dale Ratzlaff, who they have left the Adventist Church, is that they accuse the Adventist Church of being too confrontational and, 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 and are actively trying to, to, to evangelize members of other churches, calling them out of their churches. And yet... If you think about it carefully, what was the message of John the Baptist as he prepared the church back then for the first coming of Jesus? It was one of repentance and reform, challenging the leader of Israel, Herod the king, right down to the, to, to the, the, the leaders, the priests and the scribes and the Pharisees. Everybody needed a work of repentance and reform. And so, the message of the Adventist Church of calling back everybody to reform their lives, to ensure that things that were being disregarded, even by church people, should be at the forefront because repentance and reformation is necessary to prepare for the coming king. And so, I want to take a leave now of the reason why I am an Adventist. Because it is very clear that the word Adventist means one who looks for the second coming of Jesus. But not just earnestly look, but you keep it before the minds of the people. It is a primary message. And in that message of preparation for this coming of Jesus Christ... That is why I remain an Adventist because the message is so pointed about repentance and reformation for not just the man in the world, the sinner who doesn't know Jesus, the homosexual, the, 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 the gambler, the prostitute, the world, the lover, the party goer, the reveler. But the message is also for the people of God. We are in Isaiah chapter 58 and one, verse 1. We are told that as a messenger of God, you are to lift up your voice like a trumpet and let the people of God be aware of their sins, the things that they are trampling on, disregarding God in, and therefore are not ready for the coming king. Reason why I remain a Seventh-day Adventist, because the message is so pointed about Reminding people that the most important thing that you should be considering is that Jesus is coming again and your life should be in order. And that life cannot be in order unless you're aware of where you're going wrong. You're aware of your sins so that you can repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. That is why I remain a Seventh-day Adventist because the word Adventist captures the essence of what this duty of the Christian is all about. You have so many Christians who they are on Facebook and Instagram and WhatsApp and, 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 and all these various internet platforms and not one day will you see them talking about the second coming of Jesus and reminding men and women that that is a, the most significant event that will happen on this planet you got to be prepared. And so, 
when I have a church that focuses in and zeroes in on this most urgent message. Adventism. Focusing on preparing for the second advent of Jesus Christ. That is why I'm an Adventist. I'm now going to move to the second issue. The issue on which I will close this presentation. So I'm going to spend the next couple of minutes. Maybe 15, 20, 30 minutes. Before I close this episode. Dealing with the second part of the name. Or the first part of the name. Seventh day Adventist. Why am I a seventh day Adventist? And of course. I cannot do anything else. But simply. Go to the scriptures. Let me set a background before I start to deal with the issue. I mean, I've heard all of the arguments. I've been a Seventh-day Adventist for over 40 years. I grew up in the church. As a young man, a teenager, I got distracted, lost my way for a short while. Was reconverted, rebaptized, and since that time, I remember when I got reconverted and baptized and came back to God and to the church. I decided in my mind that I should not allow just the teachings of my parents and the teachings of my church, since I was a boy growing up, to be the basis for my faith. I must discover for myself why I am a Seventh-day Adventist or choose to be a Seventh-day Adventist. And I went on a personal journey of discovery. And I remember when I started to study the various religions of the world and the various denominations of, of churches out there. And I critically and carefully compared and since that time until now, I'm now in my 50s, in 2021. I have made sure that personally I leave no stone unturned. I must be able to defend why the Bible, compared to all other books out there, is valid in the first place. I must be able to defend why Christianity is the only religion that saves people ultimately. I must be able to say why is it Jesus and serving Jesus as the Lord and Savior is the only way to God and salvation. I must be able to, 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 to appeal to the atheist and the doubter as to why it makes sense to serve not just God, but the God of the Bible, Yahweh, Jehovah, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Why I believe in Jesus as someone who came to die for my sins, who went away to heaven and is going to return to set things right. I must be able to demonstrate the validity of that. And therefore, I made sure that I have studied carefully these issues over the years. And now I am going to tell you why, straight from the Bible, I am not just an Adventist, but a Seventh day Adventist who believes that the Sabbath of God's creation, Genesis chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, is important in these last days. So let me get into that issue now because you want to know, despite all of the challenges, I mean, I've heard so many arguments against the Sabbath. I mean, common one, for instance, is that the Sabbath is no longer necessary because it was only for the Jews. The Sabbath was just a, a symbol or sign pointing to Jesus as the rest for the Christian. And now that Jesus has come, he has become the rest. That is one of the arguments of Clinton Baldwin, for instance. And therefore, the Sabbath is no longer necessary as a command to keep. Um, the argument is that the Sabbath was abolished and the, 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 
early Christians eventually abandoned the Sabbath. The Gentile Christians weren't required to keep it and um, all kinds of arguments. I have heard them all. There is no new argument that anyone can come with that I have not heard or seen before in addressing the Sabbath issue. Or should I say opposed to the Sabbath issue. And so I'm going to quickly summarize for you. What are my reasons for remaining a Seventh-day Adventist? Observing the Sabbath and considering it as important as part of the Christian's life in preparation for the second coming of Jesus. I'm now going to take you to the scriptures. And there is, there is no other way for me to do this than to simply allow the scriptures to speak. And so I'm opening on screen evidence as to why. I've summarized it in written form so that it can be a little more pointed. And I'm going to start with Jesus himself because Jesus, I believe, is the ultimate source of truth. And anything he says, that's it. So here we have on screen Jesus in Matthew chapter 24, verse 20, speaking to his disciples. And now listen very carefully, my brothers and my sisters, dear listener. Remember, Jesus was speaking to those who would form his church, the apostolic church. He was not speaking to the general um, population of Jews. He was speaking to his inner circle of disciples. And after they came to him and asked him, what will be the sign of the last days? What will be the sign of this? What will be the signs of his second coming? What would be the signs showing that, first of all, this Jerusalem and Israel would be destroyed by the Romans? And secondly, what would be the signs of the last days leading to his second coming? Jesus gave a number of signs. We know them, Matthew 24 and in Luke chapter 21. But I want to zero in very closely on what Jesus said, telling us why we know that the Sabbath was not abolished and is still important. And urgent in the Christian's life as a matter for observance in respect and honor of God the creator. And to show that we love him. 1 John 5 and verse 3 tells us that if we love God we are to keep his commandments. Let me now demonstrate from the scriptures why I remain a Seventh-day Adventist. And despite all the challenges from the Clinton Baldwins of the world. And the Andre Hills of the world. And the... Um, Elsie Lauristons of the world and, and, and the Dale Ratzlaff of the world. Let us see now why we know from Jesus himself that the Sabbath remains and is an important requirement in the life of the Christian. Let us see. So in, in Matthew chapter 24, verse 20, Jesus says to his disciples who would become the core of his church, the apostolic church. He says to them, pray that your flight be not in winter. You see it on screen. I'm reading it. Neither on the Sabbath day. Notice Jesus' emphasis. The. In other words, something can, can only be called the. If it is the only one. And you are referring to it specifically. Pray that your flight be not in winter. Neither on the Sabbath day. Notice he said day. He did not just say the Sabbath. But day. In other words. Whenever this time would have been, years after, the Sabbath obviously would still exist and it would still be a day. And not just a day, but the Sabbath day, because the Bible is specific as to which day is the Sabbath day. Exodus 28 to 11 tells us that the seventh day, the last day of any week, of the week, obviously would be Saturday, is the Sabbath day. And here Jesus is telling his disciples that whenever this destruction of Jerusalem would have been in the future, pray that your flight, your escape, will not be in winter, neither on the, keep those words in mind, the Sabbath day. For then shall be great tribulation, he says, such as one has not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Now you need to keep in mind that Jesus was responding to the question what shall be the signs of two things. Signs of his 
of, of the destruction of Israel and Jerusalem and the signs of the end of the world in the future. And Jesus looked into the future, talking to his disciples who would become the core of the church, who therefore would represent his church on earth. And he's warning them, whether it be the destruction of Jerusalem or the future coming of the second coming of Jesus, be careful that you remember this important warning. Pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. But why would Jesus make this urgent warning to his disciples? You know, there are many Christians out there who think, you know, this, this was just a historical event which applied only to the Jews then. And in fact, this is how they try to explain away Jesus' reference to pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath day. This is the argument of people who have left the church like Elsie Thunder Lauriston, Dr. Um, Clinton Baldwin, um, Dale Ratzlaff. They argue that, you know, the fact is that the, 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 the Jews normally close the city gates, Jerusalem city gates on the Sabbath. And so it was not just, it was not Jesus signaling that the Sabbath will still be important or should still be kept by his disciples as late as AD 70, 30 odd years after Jesus left the earth. But it was just because the city gates would be closed for the, the other Jews who were observing the Sabbath and therefore if they were caught in the city, they could not escape. Now, I've always believed that if you want to understand the Bible, you must read the context. Don't just read one verse, but go above and below and read the whole background. And so what I'm going to do now, dear listener, is I'm going to take you straight to the Bible itself, giving greater detail on this account. And I want you to think carefully about what the Bible says. Listen to the Bible. Jesus was telling in, in Luke chapter 21, there it is on screen, I'm sharing with you so you can see. Jesus was telling his disciples, um, this is how they should relate to the destruction of not just Jerusalem, but the destruction of the Jewish nation by the Romans. And listen to his words. Verse 20 of Luke chapter 21. When you shall see Jerusalem compassed with armies, then know that desolation thereof is nigh. Notice very carefully verse 21. Then let him which are in Judea flee to the mountains. In other words, he says to those Christians who are in Judea. In other words, they are not in Jerusalem. They are not in the city. Flee to the mountains. So in other words, the city gates being closed on the Sabbath would not apply to these Christians who are in Judea. Judea is a general region in southern Israel. Let them which are in the midst of midst of it depart. It what? Jerusalem. So Jesus is saying those who are in the general area, you're not in the city, flee to the mountains. Those who are in the city, depart. Come out of it. Let them that are in the countries, in other words, the rural areas, the bush areas outside of Jerusalem, do not enter into the city. For these, he says in verse 22, will be the days of vengeance that all things which are written may be fulfilled. Warn to them that are with child and to them which give suck in those days, for there shall be great distress in the land. Notice, Jesus is not just focusing on, on Jerusalem as a city. He's focusing on the entire land of Israel. And it is in this context of the entire land of Israel. You are to flee if you are outside of the city. You are to flee if you are in the city and leave. You are to not go into the city. You are to go to the mountains. If you are in the rural parts, you are to go flee. It is therefore someone who is totally ignoring the context and the full story. Who would just say Jesus' words about, you know, Pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath day is just in reference to those who are in the city. No, because here it is, it's talking about even those who are not in the city, those who are in the country parts, the rural areas, those who are in the fields outside the city walls and city gates, those who are in the land of Judea overall. And then Jesus utters very striking words in this context. Let's go back to it. 
Jesus then utters these striking words. For those who are in the entire land of Judea, in the entire land of Israel, outside the city gates, in the rural areas, pray that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. It's not just about being for those who are in the city and city gates being closed on you and you can't escape out of the city because the gates are closed on the Sabbath. No! It is for everybody who is a Christian, who is a, who, who, who became a follower of Jesus. And wherever you live in all of Israel, as a Christian, Jesus is saying, pray that your flight, if you're in the fields and you fly, you're fleeing to the mountains. If you're in Judea, the land of Judea, outside the city, and you're fleeing to the mountains. If you're in the country parts and you're fleeing to the mountains, pray that your flight be not on the Sabbath day. Why? Because Jesus knew that the Sabbath would remain and would be important for his followers to keep. And that is why Jesus said these words before you notice the weekend of his crucifixion. His followers heard him and recognized that the Sabbath continues to be important. And that is why when they were anointing his body and they, the Sabbath came on that Friday evening, the disciples paused what they were doing. And the Bible in Luke chapter 23 says that they returned and kept the Sabbath according to the commandment. Notice Luke chapter 23 was written by the, the Gentile Christian called Luke. And he wrote this book years after the events. And Luke made a point of duty to say, according to the commandment, the disciples on the weekend of Jesus' crucifixion, they kept the Sabbath. Why? Because the Sabbath was not abolished. The Sabbath remained important to Christians who had accepted Jesus. And on, his, on the weekend of his crucifixion, they observed it. Now, if Jesus is pointing to the future, and this event of the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the Jewish nation and the, 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 the conquering of them by the Romans. The entire nation of Israel was con conquered by the Romans and their city made desolate and destroyed and people captured and killed. And this was applying to the entire nation, not just the city of Jerusalem then we know that Jesus is signaling to his disciples that 30 odd years from now, the Sabbath for those who are out in the fields, those who are in the countryside, those who are in Judea, not just the city, fleeing to the mountains, pray that your flight not be on the Sabbath day. Why? Because the Sabbath is a day when it should be a day of rest. It should be a day when you should not be undergoing too much activity and carrying burdens and all of that. It would be difficult for a Sabbath keeper. A Sabbath observer. Who is a Christian. In the entire land of Judah. Trying to escape the invasion of the Romans. It would be a difficult time. That is why Jesus said those words. The plainest example we have. In the words of Jesus himself. That Jesus looked into the future as the God and creator of the universe. And told his disciples that the Sabbath would still be valid. Would be important. And they should pray. In other words, pray that you don't have to experience this awesome, this frightening time of persecution. And invasion of the Romans and destruction of the nation of Israel. On the Sabbath day as a Christian. Whether you're in the city or outside the city, in the mountains, in the countryside, out in the fields. Let's not twist the Bible. Let allow, let's allow the Bible to speak. And so I read on the screen. There is no way that the Sabbath was meant to come to an end at the cross and become the person of Jesus, as, as Clinton Baldwin tries to claim and as Elsie Thunder Lauriston tried to claim and as Dale Ratzlaff tried to claim. Could not be if Jesus saw it in the future as a day. Notice, a day. And asked his disciples to pray they would not have to flee from persecution on the Sabbath day. I continue to read. Why? Because Jesus knew it to be burdensome to carry loads and travel on the Sabbath. 
which should be the time of rest and attending church. And a lot, a lot of people think that Sabbath is just for rest at home. Leviticus chapter 23, verse 1 to 3, read it. It tells you that the Sabbath day is a time for assembly of the brethren of the saints. And that is why in Luke chapter 14, and ver Luke chapter 4 rather, and verse 16 we see as it was Jesus' custom, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. What was the synagogue? A place of assembly for prayer and study of the word and for preaching. And so Jesus who says clearly, John chapter 15 and verse 10, I have kept my father's commandments. Jesus going to the synagogue to assemble with the worshippers of God on the Sabbath was part of the command. Luke, uh, Leviticus chapter 23, verse 1 to 3 tells us the Sabbath is a day of holy convocation. Convocation means assembly. The brethren coming together. And so I continue. I'm reading the screen. Because Jesus knew it would be burdensome to carry loads and travel on the Sabbath, which should be a time of rest and attending church. Now, it was AD 70, over 30 years after, that Judea and Jerusalem, not just Jerusalem, the city alone, Judea and Jerusalem saw Jesus' prophecy of persecution against his Christian people first, come through, uh, first coming true. And so this tells us a lot about what Jesus saw regarding the Sabbath and in the future. And keep in mind that not necessarily all of his disciples would be within the walled city of Jerusalem. Since Jesus warned them in the entire land of Judea, not just those in the city, to flee when the Romans came to persecute Israelites. For he says, there shall be great distress in the land. Luke chapter 21 and verse 23. And in that context, I'm reading the screen. They were to pray that their flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day, which could apply to those disciples both without and within the city of Jerusalem. It wasn't just a matter of the gates of the city of Jerusalem being closed on the Sabbath, preventing travel. Since the land of Judea is not Jerusalem, but simply includes the gated city, Jerusalem, as Acts 1 verse 8 makes irrefutably plain that the prophecy was about the entire land, and not just the city of Jerusalem. And this is a matter that, you know, Elsie Lauriston and Dale Ratzlaff and um, Clinton Baldwin failed to appreciate when you study the Bible in context and allow it to speak and not force your own opinions on it. Now, let me give you another reason why I know that the Sabbath remains as important for the people of God. Christians, just like the disciples that he spoke to, that Jesus spoke to who were then Christians and would be Christians 30 odd years after. Jesus, let me go back to the Bible. In, let me bring it up so you can see for yourself. In uh, Hebrews chapter 4, a passage which is not well understood by many people who read this passage, but in Hebrews chapter 4, a very important uh, verse in it says, verse 9, let me bring it up. Verse 9, there it is, you're seeing it in the center of the screen. There remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. And you may say, what kind of rest is being talked about? Well, interestingly, if you read the entire chapter, and I would advise you to pause you know, when you when you get the time and read it for yourself, Hebrews chapter 4 tells us and it mentions about four or five different types of rest. It mentions God's rest from creation in the first week of this earth's existence. It mentioned and, and it, it refers to that as God's rest from his labor, his work. There's also the rest that the people of Israel were looking forward to when they went into Canaan. Joshua who led them there when he took over from Moses. In this chapter you will notice references made to that rest in the land of Canaan. There is also the rest that is referred to that is a spiritual rest in Jesus. 
Jesus says, come unto me all that are heavy laden and I will give you rest. Nowhere in the scriptures does it speak of Jesus being the rest or the Sabbath. Jesus says, come unto me and I will give you rest. He not, did not say, I will become your rest. As Dr. Clinton Baldwin and all these, uh, Dale Raslav and all others were trying to say that, you know, since the Sabbath and the law pointed to Jesus, then he has become the Sabbath. I mean, if Jesus, how can Jesus become the Sabbath when he's telling you that 30 years after, you should pray that your flight neither be in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. He's telling you that this Sabbath day still remains and is important for Christians. Um, and that is why you should be praying that you don't have to desecrate it by trying to escape from persecution on that day. Jesus was clear. He did not in any way say he was going to become the Sabbath day or become the Sabbath rest. He says, come unto me and I will give you rest. But while that is true, he also is telling you that the Sabbath will remain. And here in, in Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, whosoever he was, whether it was Paul or some other writer, he's telling the people that they remain at a rest to the people of God. He's telling those who probably thought that, you know, the Sabbath is now abandoned. No, Paul here is, or the writer of Hebrews is telling us that there were several rests. One, the rest of God from creation. He stopped working. Two, the rest in the land of Canaan. Three, the rest in Jesus, where you no longer try to depend on yourself to save yourself but you rest in the salvation plan and Jesus and all that he has done for you is a reason for your salvation. But then I want you to notice very carefully that the writer of Hebrews here says that there remaineth a rest to the people of God. Notice verse 10, for he that is entered into his rest, whose rest? God's rest, spiritual rest, rest in salvation, the rest that Jesus says, come unto me and I'll give you rest. He that has entered into God's rest, Jesus' rest, he hath seized from his own works as God did from his. Now we need to ask the question, if the Bible here is telling us, just like Jesus said in Matthew 24 and Luke 21, that the Sabbath will remain for future observance, that's why you have to play, pray that you don't have to um, escape persecution on that day. Here the Bible is telling us that there remain at a rest. What kind of rest? Two kinds of rest are here focused on. One, spiritual rest. There remains a spiritual rest. Joshua, when he took the people of Israel into Canaan, he did not give them that rest because he was not Jesus. Only Jesus can give them that rest. The spiritual rest in Jesus. The future rest in the land of, of paradise. The new earth created. But when you enter that rest presently of by faith, of resting in Jesus, being saved from your sins, here's what it says. He also sees, he that has entered into his rest, verse 10, he has also seized from his own works, as God did from his. Now here's a question. How did God seize his works? Stopped working physically, literally, on the Sabbath. God's rest from his works was not a spiritual rest. Because God isn't a sinner. God don't need salvation. So when God rested, Genesis chapter 2 tells us in the first two verses that God not just rested. In other words, he stopped working physically. But he blessed that day and hallowed it, set it aside as a holy time. For who? For his people. And so notice the writer says, there therefore remain at a rest to the people of God. What is this rest? The spiritual rest, the rest in Jesus. But when you enter that rest, what do you do? You seize from your own works as God did from his. This has a double meaning. Because when God stopped working or rested, he seized physical labor. So when you enter God's rest as a true Christian, 
The Bible here is saying, you rest just as God did. Notice, as God did. Literal comparison. In other words, you stop physical labor. And you rest. Just as the Bible command in Exodus chapter 20, verse 8 to 11. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou nor thy son nor thy daughter. What kind of work is he talking about here? Physical work. Resting from your weekly labor of earning a living. Except you are one of those essential workers like the priests in the temple. And those who are saving lives on the Sabbath like Jesus showed and demonstrated that you can, you can save lives by doing emergency work on the Sabbath. Except for those exceptions, God is telling his people that when you enter his rest, you cease from your work just as God did from his. So it has a double meaning. You obey the commandment in Exodus chapter 20 and verse 8. And I'm going to show you shortly before I close why we know that that commandment is still in place. Not just the Sabbath, but the commandment about it is still in place. Even after Jesus left the earth. I'm coming to that. But notice it says here that when you enter God's rest, in other words, God's spiritual rest, the rest that still remains for everybody to enter into. Spiritual rest from, from, from your sins, being saved by Jesus and waiting in hope for the future paradise where you will rest eternally in, in the land of, of future Canaan. But when you enter that rest, you cease from your works. Just as God did. So God physically stopped working. And so you should also. Because he commanded it. Physically stop working on the Sabbath. And that is why Jesus said. Pray that your flight be not in winter. 30 years after. Or on the Sabbath day. When you should be physically resting. That's why I am still a Seventh-day Adventist. Because the Bible compels me. That this is the truth. And how do I know? I can give you no more reasons why I know that this is the truth. Now, many people don't realize this, you know, but in the book of, in the, in the chapter called Hebrews 4 that I'm now reading on screen, there are Greek words there for the rest, the several types of rest that are recorded. And when you read carefully in the Greek, you notice that, let me now bring the Greek up on screen so you can see. And I'm going to give you examples. So here we have in verse 4, in verse 1 of Hebrews 4, it says, Let therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Now that word rest, there's a Greek word for it. Let me click it. There it is. Clicking it. Kataposis. The Greek for this kind of rest. When we go further down, every time the word rest appears, there's a different Greek word for it. For instance, in verse 3, it says, For in which, for we which have believed enter into rest. Let me click that rest again for you to see. There it is. Catapausis. That's the rest. When we come to God resting from his labor, from his work, verse 4, it says, He spake, that means Moses, in a certain place of the seventh day of on this wise, and God did rest. Click it. There it is. Katapau, a different word. So the spiritual rest is katapausis. God physically stopping his work of creation on the seventh day, the day that he called the Sabbath and blessed it. Katapau. Let's continue and you'll see what I mean. When the people of Israel entered Canaan, which they considered a kind of rest, verse 5. And in this place again, they shall end seeing their... Uh, no, let me read, go back up earlier. Um, I'm trying to find where it speaks about Josh, Joshua. Verse 8. Verse 8 says, For if he, Jesus, this word should have actually been translated Joshua. This is King James Version, and it should have been translated Joshua. For if Joshua had given them, in other words, Israelites, rest. Let me click that word rest and you'll see. Katapau. So the word rest throughout this passage 
is not the same Greek word being used right throughout. And people study this passage and you need to understand the real meaning of the passage. You have to get into the Greek. And so when we come down to verse 9, where it says, There remaineth therefore a rest. Let's go and see what that word is. Notice, sabbatismos. There is a total switch by, by the writer of Hebrews. Notice all the rests that he was talking about earlier. Catapausis, the spiritual rest. Catapau, rest in the land of Canaan. Um, but notice now when he talks about the rest that remains. The same way Jesus spoke of the rest. The Sabbath that will be in the future. In Matthew chapter 24 and Luke chapter 21. The writer of Hebrews now introduced a brand new word when he says there is a rest. Which rest remain? New word. There it is. Sabbatismus. And when it is the only place in the Bible that it, this word appears. And for us to understand the meaning of it, we have to go to the Greek language. And in the Greek language, there is only one meaning of this word. And it simply means literal keeping of the Sabbath day. And so, why does this literal Sabbath keeping remain for the people of God? Because, notice the next verse. He that has entered into his rest. Which rest is this talking? Catapausis, the spiritual rest. He also sees from his own works as God did from his. How did God seize from his work? Physically stopping labor. And therefore when a Christian enters the spiritual rest of God, you have to keep the Sabbath, the, the, the Sabbatismus, the rest that remains for the people of God. Why? Because all the other festivals of Israel were now abandoned. They were no longer important. We're coming to that part of scripture. So the only rest among them that remain for the people of God, Christians in the future, or after Jesus left this earth, would have been the sabbatismos and the catapausis. Catapausis, the spiritual rest. When you enter that spiritual rest, you observe the rest that remain of all the festivals that were abandoned, whether it be the Feast of Tabernacles or it be the Passover or it be, you know, the various annual festivals of Israel. The rest that remain for the people of God, that God consider important for you still to observe as part of his commandments or his law, would have been the Sabbatismus rest. The only definition for Sabbatismus let me say it again. There remain, therefore, a rest, sabbatismus, literal Sabbath keeping for the people of God. For he that has entered God's rest, catapauses, the spiritual rest, you cease from your own works, just as God did from his. God rested physically. Therefore, those who are in God's spiritual rest, catapauses, you keep a literal rest, sabbatismus. And you can't tell the Greeks or those who are the, the, the users of the Greek language what the word sabbatismus is supposed to mean. It literally means to keep the Sabbath. And how do we know that people are supposed to keep the Sabbath after Jesus left as Christians and as true worshippers of God? Let's now go to the proofs. And I'm going to take you now, dear listener, to the final set of proof. And I'm calling it, as you can see on screen, important biblical evidence for Sabbath keeping after the cross. And I'm reading the screen so that it comes off clearer to you. The record of the early church and the post-cross period, post-cross mean after the cross and after Jesus left, in the book of Acts shows that Paul and his Christian partners, notice, not just Paul, but Paul and his Christian partners, who will discover who they are shortly, kept the Sabbath faithfully every week, just as Jesus did in Luke chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. 
And Paul says, you are to be followers of me. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 1, as I am also follower of Christ. What did Paul do? I continue to read. He met Sabbath keepers who were both Jews and Gentiles in fulfillment of Isaiah 56 and verse 1. And you may say, what does Isaiah 56 and verse 1 says? Now, here it is. I'm taking you to it. Let me turn off the Greek so you can see clearly. I'm going to Isaiah chapter... Uh, I'm going to Isaiah chapter 56 so you can see for yourself. I don't just want to report it to you. Isaiah considered the gospel prophet prophesying what would happen in the gospel age during the time of the Messiah and after. And here is what Isaiah prophesied. Thus saith the Lord, Jehovah, our creator, keep ye judgment and do justice for my salvation is near to come. And my righteousness to be revealed. This passage is relating both to before Jesus came as Messiah and after he became Messiah. Because the prophecies of Isaiah, they covered Jesus' entire relationship to his church from he came until after he established the coming kingdom and new, new, the new earth. And that is why, for instance, if you read Isaiah 53 about the suffering servant and Messiah, it covers his coming to earth at his first coming. And it also covers his second coming where he establishes the kingdom after he died for our sins. So this prophecy is a call of God to everybody during the gospel age. Listen to it. Thus saith the Lord, keep ye judgment and do justice for my salvation is near to come and my righteousness to be revealed. Blessed is the man, notice it not say the Jew or the Israelite, the man that doeth this, the son of man that laid hold on it and keep this Sabbath from polluting it. Verse 3, you thought that this was just relating to Israel or the Jews? No, notice, neither let the son of the stranger, this is no reference to the Gentiles. That has joined himself to the Lord. So whether you join yourself to the Lord as, a, as a, you become a Jew in the time of ancient Jews. Or you become a follower of Jesus as a Gentile. Neither let the son of a stranger that has joined himself to the Lord speak saying the Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. In other words the requirements for the Jews and for Christians who are Jews is not the same requirement for me. Notice the Lord. The, 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 the Gentile should not say the Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. Neither let the eunuch, who's a eunuch? Someone who cannot be circumcised because they don't have an organ to be circumcised like a normal Jew. But you are still part of God's call to observe the Sabbath. Notice, for thus said the Lord unto the eunuchs. In other words, you can't be circumcised. You're a Gentile and you don't have a penis to be, to be circumcised. But God is saying to the eunuchs that keep my Sabbath and choose the things that please me and take hold of my, notice, take hold of my covenant. Because part of God's covenant with his people is for you to obey his law. And I'm coming to that to show you that it is still the same in the New Testament. Even then will I give in mine house and within my walls. In other words, the sons of the strange or the Gentiles and eunuchs who could not even be circumcised. Even then will I give in mine house and within my walls a place and a name better than sons and daughters. And for those who always thought that the Sabbath was only for Jews. Anybody who joins yourself to God to be his true worshiper. Here is God's call to all. I will give them an everlasting name that shall not be cut off. Verse 6 goes back to the Gentiles again. Also the sons of the stranger that joined themselves with the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord. To be his servants. Everyone that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and take it hold of my covenant. Even them will I bring to my holy mountain. The new Jerusalem. Paradise. And make them joyful in my house of prayer. And you may say, well, this might have applied to, you know, those Gentiles and eunuchs and strangers to the land of Israel who became Israelites. You know, they were proselytes and they were converted to the Jewish faith before the time of Jesus. Well, 
Let's allow the Bible to speak. I'm going to show you now, my brothers and my sisters, dear listeners, why we cannot take that approach because the Bible does not support it. The Bible shows clear evidence that this was applying to Jews and Gentiles before Jesus came and after Jesus left the earth. Notice carefully. In the book of Acts, you want to understand what the true church of God is supposed to be like? Read the book of Acts. That is where the apostolic church, the church in its purity that Jesus left on earth. Model for us what the Christian church should be like now. Now watch carefully. In Acts chapter 16 and verse 13, Paul and his travel, traveling companions. Remember, Luke is the writer of the book of Acts. So when he says we, he includes himself. And remember who was Luke? Luke was a Gentile who was converted to the Christian faith. And notice now, Luke fulfilling what Isaiah 56 prophesied was going to happen to all that God called to be true worshippers. Listen carefully. And on the Sabbath, the same Sabbath that Jesus predicted 30 years after, would be the Sabbath day that you should pray that your flight don't be on winter or on that Sabbath day. Jesus said, and on the Sabbath, not Jesus, Luke rather, in Acts chapter 16 and verse 13 says, remember now, this is the apostolic church. These are Christians talking. And on the Sabbath, we, who are the we? Paul and his fellow Christian travelers, including Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was want to be made. And we sat down and spake unto the women which resorted. Resorted means to assemble, to gather. Why were they gathering? It is a Sabbath. Because this Sabbath is a day of holy convocation. Levit Leviticus chapter 23, verse 1 to 3. A day of holy gathering and assembly. That's why Jesus went to the synagogue on the Sabbath. It was just to stay at home and rest, as some people think. Notice. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshipped God. So she was a believer and an acceptor of the Christian faith. Heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, that she attended other things which were spoken of Paul. So she became a converted believer. And where did she do that? Not in a synagogue. Where, you know, some, some, one of the arguments of Dale Ratzlaff and Elsie Lauriston Fund and Dr. Clinton Baldwin is that, you know, Paul's going into, practice of going into the synagogue on the Sabbath day was just to, to convert the Jews who were Sabbath keepers. Really? Well, here it is outside the city. On the Sabbath day, we, Luke, who's a Gentile, and Paul, they gathered to do what was supposed to be done on the Sabbath. For prayer, for preaching, for worship. And it came to pass that as we, we who, Luke the Gentile and Paul the converted Christian, went to prayer, a certain damsel possessed with the spirit of divination met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. saying, the same followed Paul, so even she was converted too. The same followed Paul and us and cried, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, which show unto us the way of salvation. They were not in a synagogue. They were not in the temple. This was not a Jewish activity. This was an activity being observed by Gentiles and Jews together who are Christians. And notice the emphasis. On the Sabbath, we... Went out of the city by a riverside where prayer was meant to be made. So they were gathering in assembly to do what is normally done on the Sabbath. Let's go to the second evidence. In Acts chapter 13, remember I am pointing you back to God's call in Isaiah 56. To all Jews, Gentiles, eunuchs, even those who could not be circumcised. And we want to prove that it was not just a call for those before Jesus, but after Jesus left this earth. Notice, and when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath. Notice, the Gentiles. Now, when the congregation has broken up, many of the Jews and religious proselytes, Followed Paul and Barnabas, who, speaking to them, persuaded them to continue in the grace of God. Notice, continue in the grace. 
of God. People who were observing the Sabbath and the next week when they assembled would not be on a Sunday or any other time. On the Sabbath, Paul is saying, continue in the grace of God. So they were keeping the Sabbath while continuing in the grace of God. Notice, and the next Sabbath came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God because the Sabbath is a day of holy convocation, of assembly, wherever you are, whether by a riverside or in a synagogue or in a temple or today in a church building. That's the purpose of the Sabbath. Not just to rest physically as God did from his works, but to also assemble with the people of God for prayer, for worship and for Bible study. And notice, Gentiles fulfilling Isaiah's call in Isaiah 56. So they were not just converts to Judaism and the religion of the Jews, but they were also acceptors of Jesus when they, it was preached to them and they asked for more the following Sabbath. The next Sabbath came on us a whole city, which obviously would be <laughs> more Gentiles, more than Jews. Let's go to the third evidence. Now when Paul, Acts chapter 13 and verse 13. Now when Paul and his company, what was his company? Luke the Gentile along with the other Christian traveling companions of Paul. Luke from Paphos. They came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John departing from them returned to Jerusalem. And when they departed from Perga, they, in other words, Paul and his traveling companions who were all Christians. Went into the synagogue. So all these persons who love to talk about, you know, Paul was going to the synagogue because it's, a, it's, a, it's an opportunity to preach to the Jews. Notice, they, because they were assembling for worship, they went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. And after the reading of the law, because it was a day of holy convocation and assembly, Le Leviticus chapter 23 Verse 1 to 3. And after the reading of the law and the prophets and the rulers of sent, sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if you have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. Notice, exhortation. And then Paul stood up and beckoning with his hand, said, Men of Israel, and ye, notice the and, and ye that fear God. It, clear reference to both Jews and Gentiles there. After the cross, observing the Sabbath. Let's go to the next evidence. Acts chapter 17. Now when they, here we go again, Paul and his traveling companions were all Christians, passed through um, Amphipolis and Apollonia. They, notice collective, came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul as his manner was went into them and three Sabbath days reasoned with them out of the scriptures opening and alleging so he was not just observing the sabbath but he was also preaching to unbelievers in jesus and of course exhorting those who already believed um evidence number five acts chapter 18 verse 1 says and after these things paul departed from athens and came to corinth and, and found a certain jew named aquila born in pontus Lately come from Italy, which is with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome and came unto them. And because he was of the same craft, notice, it is now describing Paul's working week, notice. And because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought by their occupation because they were tent makers. Here the Bible describing the working week of Paul as a Christian. And then notice now, what did he do on the Sabbath? Just as he did with his traveling companions who were Gentiles. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greeks. Because the Sabbath is a day of assembly and worship. And to keep that day holy, God's call to both the Jews and the Gentiles. Now, you know. It is evident, I am reading the screen, evidence that long after the cross, Paul and his fellow Gentile apostle, Luke and other Christian companions, every week treated with respect the day that is called the Sabbath, making it a time to gather with, pray with, preach to, 
and exhort the worshippers of God and those who feared God, both Jews and Gentiles who respected the gospel of Christ and even those yet who, who didn't yet. So did the Sabbath day still exist for Paul and Luke, the Gentile, even after years after Jesus' ascension? You saw it for yourself. I don't want to say it. You have read it for yourself, dear listener, in the very words of God. Even when I continue to read, a synagogue or meeting place was not available. Paul and his traveling Christian companions, including Luke the Gentile, by example, sought out a prior meeting place outdoors to engage in what the Sabbath was for. Meditation, gathering together, prior and preaching. A total of over 80 weekly Sabbaths, Sabbath days. Paul and his traveling companions kept. Just as we saw in the example of Jesus, who in Luke chapter 4 and verse 16 onwards, he did what his father commanded. Gather with the brethren. Assemble on the Sabbath day. Apart from resting physically, you're also gathering for worship and for study and for preaching and prayer. Now notice carefully, I'm continuing to read. On none of these Sabbath days is Paul ever seen working. None. That's instructive. And those like Elsie Lauriston and Dale Ratzlaff and Dr. Clinton Baldwin and all the other critics and those who have left the church who think Paul only attended the synagogues of the Jews just to preach to them weekly but was not observing the Sabbath. They are simply closing their eyes from seeing the plain truth. It was Paul and his traveling companions, including the Gentile companion Luke, doing it all together. Not just Paul visiting the synagogues to just preach as is often argued. You know, my dear listener, I could go on and on and on. But I tell you, the truth of the matter is very plain. For me, I can't help but recognizing as I close that under the new dispensation, God's new covenant with his people, those are true worshipers. This is where I'm going to close now to show you what convinces me beyond the shadow of a doubt that not only does a Sabbath remain as a day to be observed, but it is commanded in scripture. And you, you trample on it. You take it lightly. You do so to your own peril. Let's now go to my final scriptures. Which will show you why I remain a Seventh-day Adventist. Let's go to the scriptures. And I'm going to show you that God is serious about this call in Isaiah 56. To all, not just Jews, but to Gentiles before and after the cross observe his sabbath let me prove to you that god's commandments they that were within the ten commandments are part of the new covenant everybody knows that the ark of the covenant that was built by moses was a box in which was placed the ten commandments that's the purpose for which it was built let's go to kings to prove that first Kings. let's go to chapter eight and i'm going to read verse nine and I'm going to prove it to you why that box was built. There was nothing in the ark. There it is on screen. The ark of the covenant. Save the two tables of stone. In other words, that's the purpose for which it, which it was built. Which Moses put there at Horeb, meaning Sinai. When the Lord made a covenant with the children of Israel. When they came out of the land of Egypt. That's the purpose of the box called the Ark of the Covenant. Let's go to verse 20 in the same verse Kings and verse first Kings verse 8. Notice verse 21. I have placed there a place for the Ark wherein is the covenant of the Lord. So notice the Ten Commandments summarized the entire relationship that God had with his people. All commandments, 600 and odd commandments and all instructions and everything that God had as a relationship with people of Israel was considered part of the covenant. Part of, but a summary of it. God himself wrote with his own finger on Mount Sinai. Exodus chapter 30, 
1. You can read the end of the chapter and you will see. God himself wrote it. He didn't entrust Moses to write it because it was so important for God to identify himself with it. These are his laws, my laws, more important than everything else because it's the summary that I myself had written. That is what God is trying to communicate when he himself wrote the Ten Commandments. And notice now, in verse 21 of 1 Kings 8, And I have set there a place for the ark, wherein is the covenant of the Lord, which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Now, follow me closely. Some people believe that, you know, this covenant where God had this relationship with his people and it was summarized in the Ten Commandments for them to obey was abolished. Really? Now, if these are God's own laws that he himself wrote, it must mean they are more important than the others. The others are important and just and, and are very important. But anything that God writes with his own hand, with his own finger, and did not even allow Moses to write, all Moses is was to write a report about what was on the on the tablets. These must be more than anything else what God calls his own laws, my laws. Now you want to know whether or not those laws were abolished that God calls his laws that he himself wrote? Let's go to the New Testament and see what the new covenant is all about. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 8. And in Hebrews chapter 8, I won't, I won't tell you my opinions. I will tell you what God says. Listen to the words of God. I'm reading verse 8 of Hebrews 8. Now notice. Verse 8, let me go to verse 8 and read onwards. Finding fault with them, in other words, the Jews, Israel of old. He saith, meaning God, behold the days come, saith the Lord, when I will make a new covenant. Remember the covenant is summarized, not just all of all the general 600 and law, odd, odd laws of the, of the Jews, but summarized in the highest matter of importance. In the Ten Commandments placed within the Ark for the Covenant or of the Covenant. <coughs> now notice. <coughs> when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. The covenant that you and I today as Gentiles, or if you're listening and you're not a literal Jew, you're a Gentile like myself, is subscribing to claiming the name of Christ that he saved us through this new covenant. What does that new covenant say? Verse 9. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in a day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, said the Lord. Now notice, God finds fault with Israel. Them. He didn't find fault with his covenant. He finds fault with them. So he now creates a new covenant. What's the new covenant? For this is a covenant I... Listen to Jehovah God speaking, dear listener. This is a covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. In other words, a new covenant that you and I are claiming if we are Christians. If you're listening to my voice at this point and you're a Christian, this is a covenant that you're claiming to be a part of. For this is a covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my... Did he say faith? Did he say spirit? No. God is renewing the covenant. Why? Because Israel failed at the covenant. And if you recall, God says, let me, before I, before I exegete this verse 10, let me go to what God says in relation to covenants. Listen carefully. In relation to God and the, the keeping of covenants, here is what God says. This is the wrong slide. Let me choose the proper slide. Psalm 89 and verse 34. God with reference to his covenant with the kings of Israel and David. And that, you know, they would rule upon a throne and govern his people. God utter a principle that applies to any covenant that he makes. Notice he says, my covenant I will not break. Nor alter the word that has gone out of my lips. Now if God utter a ten commandments, summary of his law. And he called that a covenant. And he found fault with the people of Israel observing this covenant. What is God saying? He will never alter it. 
and he will not break his own covenant. Psalm 89 and verse 34. So now let us see what God is doing when he renews this covenant with Israel. That's why it's called a new covenant. Notice verse 10. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind. You can't put within somebody's mind and heart something that is no longer in existence or is abolished. No, he will put that same covenant that he will not alter or break. Know into the minds and hearts of his true followers in the Christian dispensation. I will put my laws and there is no other law that can answer to the label as being God's own laws as much as. Notice I did not say only, but as much as the Ten Commandments because he himself wrote them and that is what he called his covenant. And God is saying this, this covenant which I will not alter or break. I will now put my laws in the new covenant in your mind and write them in your heart. That is why in Psalm 40 and verse 8, David says, I delight to do thy will. Yea, thy law is within my heart. That is what God wants to accomplish all along. Within our lives, the law of God must become a natural demonstration of his power. Him living out his own life within us through his Holy Spirit. So how will God accomplish putting his law, that same covenant he's renewing, putting the law in our heart now so that when Jesus lives within, when the Holy Spirit lives within, you naturally observe God's law because you love him. And that is why, so let me just read the rest of this and then go to a new passage to show you. That is why God is telling us when faith in Jesus has come and you're saved by grace and you're under the new covenant. What will you be doing? Let us see it from the Bible itself. Romans chapter, Romans chapter 3. <clears throat> I'm wrapping up dear listener because... I've gone long enough on this, but the picture is clear. These are the Bible-based reasons which nobody can convince me otherwise. Why I will remain a Seventh-day Adventist. Listen to this. Romans chapter 3 and verse 31. When you accept Jesus by faith, you are under the new covenant. And God has, God has accepted you as part of the household of faith. Notice what Paul says, the same Paul we read earlier, regularly and constantly keeping the Sabbath. Just as Jesus predicted, the Sabbath would remain. And the writer of Hebrews showed us that the Sabbath would remain because when you enter God's rest, you observe Sabbath keeping, Sabbatismus, just as God rested from his work physically at the creation. Notice, do we then make void the law through faith? Which law? Obviously, the law of God, which is any time reference is made to the law of God, it can refer to a number of things. It can refer to general commandments outside of the ten, as well as in, including the ten. But generally speaking, when reference is made to the law, it is what is summarized as most important among God's laws, and it's the ten. That is why when Jesus was asked, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said, keep the commandments. And they asked him, which? What did Jesus do? He quoted examples from the Ten Commandments. Why? Because those are primarily more than any other. They are not the only, but they are the prime ones. They summarize the covenant. And so in the New Testament, Paul is saying to Gentiles in Rome, do we then make void the law through faith? God forbid. No, we establish it. Why you have to establish it? Because it is what God is going to put in your heart as a New Testament, New Covenant Christian to observe naturally. It cannot be that they were abolished. The old covenant is abolished. The old, the whole, the, the, the old agreement between God and Israel why abolish? Because he found fault with them. They broke his covenant. They, they, they refused to obey him as they should have. 
What does God now do? Renew the covenant by calling it a new covenant. And what does he do? He places that same law which summarizes the covenant in the heart. And there's only one way that it can be done. The Holy Spirit enters and lives out within us, empowers us to obey God out of love. That is why he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. 1 John 5 and verse 3. We serve God. We keep his commandments not because we want to save ourselves, but because when he saves us through Jesus, we can't do anything else but show our love for him in appreciation by obeying him. That's how it works. I come now to my final scripture. There are so many things I can I can quote in the New Testament to show why I will remain a Seventh-day Adventist. But let me close with this. In the final analysis, when God is going to judge all of his people and decide who shall be saved, let's go to Revelation chapter 11. And I'm going to show you something Dear listener, in the language of Revelation, remember Revelation is the last book of the Bible, which is the revelation of Jesus Christ. This is not the revelation of John the Revelator. No, the revelation of Jesus Christ. The first verse of that book says it. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. The revelation of Jesus. This is his final revelation to us. What does Jesus say? In Revelation chapter 11. In fact, let me go up to verse 1 first so you get the context. John in, says in symbol, there was given unto me a reed like unto a rod. In other words, it's almost like a ruler. And the angel said, stood saying, rise and measure the temple of God. Now, here is a symbol for the people of God. The temple. We are lively stones which build together a temple. Jesus is the head cornerstone. We are the lively stones built to make the temple of God. Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. Measure. In other words, you are comparing the people of God to a standard, which is a ruler. Let's go down now to verse 18 of the chapter. And we'll see how God's people are being measured against a standard. Listen carefully. And the nations were angry. And thy wrath is come on the time of the dead that they should be judged. And that thou shouldest give reward unto thy servants. The time has come for God to judge all and give rewards. And there must be a standard to determine who is genuine and who is not. Notice. To give reward unto thy servants, the prophets. And to the saints, and to them that fear thy name, small and great. From the most insignificant up to the most important or most renowned like David and Moses and the others. Notice, and should as destroy them that destroy the earth. God is now at the final state of deciding who will be saved. And as he's measuring his people against a standard. Notice, the temple of God was opened. In heaven. And there was seen in his temple. The ark of his testament. Testament here means covenant. This is new testament. This is future. This is God deciding ultimately the destiny of all who shall be saved. And what is God's standard? Notice. The temple of God was opened in heaven. And there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. There were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and a great hail. God is, is announcing via loud announcement. Lightnings and voices and thundering and earthquake and great hail of how important this is. So when he's going to judge his people, he says, listen. What's the standard? Here it is. The ark of my testament. Because my new covenant that I have with Israel. That Gentiles don't are a part of. Is me putting within your heart. The covenant which I will not break. Nor alter the thing that has come out of my mouth. And that is why. The commandments. Are still important. The ten commandments. They were not abolished. The old agreement with the ancient Jews was abolished. 
but it was renewed under a new covenant because God does not make a mistake and so he will not alter his own law. The Ten Commandments. What does he do? He puts them in our heart and through the power of his Holy Spirit, they are lived out in our lives. And obviously, you know, we are not robots. So we have to cooperate. God is not going to force you to observe the first commandment. He says, thou shalt have no other God before me. You have to choose. You can choose to worship television and movie stars. And you can choose to, to worship the things of this earth. False gods. But you also have to choose to worship the true God of heaven. The creator of heaven and earth. So while he puts that law in your heart to be lived out through his Holy Spirit, you are not a robot. You have to choose it. You have to choose that you will not worship graven images and bow down to mere idols and statues and saints and whatever. You will choose to not take God's name in vain and respect his, his name and not utter his name irreverently and use it with caution just like angels who veil their faces in God's presence. And because God is putting in our heart his covenant, his laws, you have to choose to obey his command. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shall thou labor and do all thy work. If this knowledge is revealed to you and you reject it, you have chosen a path of rebellion. And you could make excuses from now until eternity. It will not change God's mind. He says, he, I, my covenant will I not break, nor alter the thing that has gone out of my mouth. So finding fault with the Jews, what did he do? Renew his covenant, and that covenant is not altered. He's putting that, those same ten commandments in our hearts by those who choose to obey him. Why I will remain a Seventh-day Adventist? Because I choose to remain with God, and I choose to recognize as God as my creator. And when I enter his spiritual rest. I sabbatismos. Because there remains a sabbath keeping for the people of God. Hebrews 4 and verse 9. A sabbatismos. A literal sabbath keeping. Because when I enter God's spiritual rest. I too will cease from my work. Just as God did from his. Hebrews 4 and verse 10. How did God cease? He stopped working. He blessed and he hallowed the Sabbath day as a way to remember him as creator. And he commands me in the old covenant and in the new covenant because the, those same laws, he says, I will not alter them. I will not put them in your heart. And that is why I will remain a Seventh-day Adventist. And I close, dear listener, with the words of Revelation chapter 22. Last book of the Bible. Let me go to verse 14. Revelation chapter 22 says. This is God speaking. This is Jesus speaking on his father's behalf. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Final message to the church. A final warning to all those in the hearing of my voice. Blessed. Verse 14. I'm reading it on screen. Blessed are they that do his, whose commandment, God's commandments. Same commandment, God says, I will not alter or break the covenant I made. What I will do is simply put them in your heart and give you the power to obey and to observe them. Blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city. My dear listener, I don't know about you, but if God is the one who saves me and he tells me how I should be saved, I can't do otherwise. I can't listen to the philosophies of men who misunderstand the scriptures and twist them. I have to take the word as it reads. And you have seen I have taken you through the word. I will, in, a, in an upcoming episode, deal with all of the opposing arguments. People who say, well, Sabbath is abolished in Colossians chapter 2. And Romans 14 tells us we can observe any day we feel like in honor of God and whatever. 
I will come to all of those. But I can't, Jesus, God didn't build the world in one day. He made the world in six days. So I, who is not God, cannot deal with everything at one time. So I will certainly address those issues in fairness to you, dear listener, who may be wondering about those issues. You, may, you will want to find out how come those arguments are presented, how come those scriptures are in the Bible, and I'm still observing the Sabbath. Oh, I will show you in the upcoming episodes. Thank you for listening in this first episode. Thank you for hearing me out, staying with me. I urge you to read the scriptures for yourselves that I have put to your attention on screen. But I leave with this final warning or final urging from God. Notice he says in verse 14 of Revelation 22. Blessed. Are those who continue to chastise Adventists. And, and, and also want to honor God. By being obedient to him. Oh they call us legalists. And we're trying to save ourselves. By commandment keeping. But listen to the God of the Bible. Blessed are those that do his commandments that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter in through the gates into the city for without our dogs and sorcerers and whoremongers and murderers and idolaters and notice who's included in the list and whosoever love it and make it a lie you speak a word that is totally opposed to what i just showed you in god's own scriptures you're speaking a lie. You will be among those who are lost. I close by urging you, dear listener, to heed the warning of God himself. Be blessed by obeying him. Blessed are those that do his commandments, that they may have right to the tree of life. And I want you to notice something here as I close. God himself who says his covenant he will not break. The laws that he made they are perfect. And so he will put them in our hearts. The Jews failed. He will not fail. Because he will not alter it but he will give it the power to keep it. He will put his covenant instead of on a, on a table of stone. He will not write them in your heart. Notice. God's description of those who escape the mark of the beast and all of the deceptions in these last days in Revelation chapter 14 are those who God describes this way. Here are those who keep, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments. Keep! Not my words, God's words. Who keep the commandments of God. The same commandments that is summarized in his covenant. That he says he will not alter. But instead put them in our hearts. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. And the faith of Jesus. Faith of Jesus. Either you believe in Jesus. And you are saved through his grace by his blood. Or you follow Jesus' example. It can mean those two things. You are those who keep the commandments of God and you keep close to your breast. The faith of Jesus as an example to follow. The Jesus who kept his father's commandments. The Jesus who went to church on Sabbath. And the Jesus who showed us by telling us that you should pray that your flight don't have to be on the Sabbath day in the future. He tells us that God will not alter his commandments. That's why they would remain including the Sabbath for Jesus to look into the future and tell us, pray that you don't have to be fleeing from persecution on the Sabbath that I myself set up as creator God before I came to earth. My brothers and my sisters, my dear listener, this is the reason why I will remain a Seventh-day Adventist. God willing, God enabling me, I will continue to tell it just like it's in the Bible. 
because what can I do? Here I stand. I can do no other. I can't do any other, my brothers, my sisters. So despite all the voices are out there, despite all of those who will try to denigrate and to cast all kind of negative um, aspersions on Seventh-day Adventists, but until you can show me in the word otherwise, here I stand. I can do no other. Thank you for listening.